Hello there. Welcome back to News Hour. Let's take a look at some of the stories across the world making the headlines. With me to review them are journalists Nabila Ramdani and Asa Bennett. Good to have you in the studio. Hello. Um, so let's start with Putin. Putin proposing constitutional amendments. We've talked a lot about this, uh, limiting presidential power after he steps down, or maybe he's not going to step down. What do you make of it, Asa? Well, certainly fascinating from the enigmatic Russian <laughs> yeah, strong man, because obviously the man who's been there re-elect president for four terms, serving four terms, uh, now says he just mysteriously wants to have a new law and measures in that will make a limit of only two terms as president. And previously, he's had this lovely revolving door system with Dmitry Medvedev, the prime minister, in which he would sort of resign and then take over, and then Medvedev would be president, and Putin would be the prime minister, and then Ooh, do but vice no versa. no longer. Medvedev's just, gone off somewhere else. Mysteriously, he just resigned 10 minutes afterwards, said, OK, you know, Vladimir needs to have the right to appoint his own ministers. And so, in short, with all this classic criminology I'm sure you've been covering all day. Um, I think it's that there'll be some magic, you know, apparatchik style system in which he turns out to be head of the Security Council <laughs> and doesn't need to worry about elections anymore. It's definitely something to try and keep him going. He wants to knock on the head the idea that he's going to go in 2024. Apparently, the opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, said only an idiot would believe mm. that Putin would leave power in 2024. And that does seem to be the way it's headed. Yes, indeed. I mean, it certainly seems to me that Putin has been on the world stage forever anyway. And there's no doubt that he's power crazed. And if he could, he would remain president for life. And, um, you know, that's where there's that's why there's a certain amount of irony, really, in him trying to now limit the time uh, for presidency, um, well, I mean, the time for... Well, control president the start, person but... coming after you. I mean, it's, it's, it's a classic uh, Machiavellian <laughs> technique, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, not so... talking about him, of course, but his <laughs> successor. Uh, let's talk about um, women workers. Now, apparently, women now hold over half of all payroll jobs in America. I mean, that's quite a milestone, isn't it? Yes, indeed. But I, it, I think this story is all about the inevitable march of history, really. I think, you know, as recently as the 50s, the 1960s or 70s, there were plenty of women and indeed men who considered that the woman's place was to stay at home. And at the very most, you know, they could hold secretarial jobs. But there have been huge changes in uh, the uh, workplace, uh, certainly over the last 10, 15 years. And there have been incentives such as improved childcare, for example, and more generally a more feminist outlook on society and the role of women in society. But they, but they tend to go into certain sectors. And uh, as we've discussed before, uh, being in more um, employment roles doesn't mean they're getting paid the same amount of money or having the same... Uh, amount of seniority. Yes, indeed. And I think one of the practical reasons for this uh, particularly oriented US stories is that it shows that, you know, the move from um, male dominated uh, industries such as manufacturing to more um, service to the more service side of the economy, which tend to attract uh, more women. And I think this is, uh, you know, an improvement, certainly, and uh, especially in the workplace and on the basic level of equal rights, this is certainly a positive story. Do men benefit from this because uh, women do tend to, to lead the way when it comes to demands for flexible hours and, and paid leave? Well, look, speaking as the token man on this panel, I'd just like to make clear, you know, it's striking the stats aren't necessarily telling a story of, oh, you know, men being inherently feckless and women being the sort of Rosie the Riveters, taking all the jobs, doing everything. I do feel it's... like we are doing everything. Well, yeah, I would stop you in thinking that. <laughs> because in the meantime, it definitely does speak to the idea of a more flexible working space, um, in that, obviously, then women may all be able to be able to favour more parts of part-time work in that sense, making jobs that work for them. And, of course, as you were saying earlier, that many of the jobs, the headline statistics that show and suggest that there are more women on the payroll would also show that many of them will be more part-time, maybe underemployed, but right. you have to hope they're employed as much as they want to be. Uh, let's move on to a story we were talking about um, here on the programme uh, just a few minutes ago. A passenger plane dumping fuel over several schools as it made an emergency landing at Los Angeles Airport. I think we have a picture uh, of the, uh, the repercussions uh, on uh, the children. Let's have a look at that. Oh, here we go. So these are children coming out of the school. Now, apparently, they uh, suffered breathing difficulties uh, and skin irritation. You can see some of them uh, covering their mouth here. Now, the pilot did it because he was trying to reduce the weight of the plane when he was coming in. But, yeah, this is going to be a massive investigation, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. What a foul-up on this part. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of far from standard practice, certainly, and just t totally awful then for these children, having to suffer such an arbitrary and harmful act. Do we know what the airline has said? Has the airline said anything or no, tried to justify it in any way? 
I mean, as you said, you know, they do that to reduce the weight of the plane, but you would think that after more than a century of regular, you know, uh, practice, you know, they would have been measured. Yeah, the pilot we too. spoke to said there was obviously going to be some re retraining involved. Uh, let's move on to Japan. Japan's environment minister has announced that he intends to take paternity leave for the birth of his first child. Why is this such a big deal? Well, because he's taking it for two weeks. You may think, again, big whoop, what's that about? Stuff are pretty standard. <laughs> but in Japan, you're allowed to take it up to a year. So the paternity leave, but culturally they just don't. That's not the done thing. Um, you know, in the same way that many of these flexible working companies that say you can have as much paternity leave as you want, like Virgin, for example, they may rely on the fact that inherently social structures suggest you won't do it. You don't want to seem like the oddball going all out. So for Japan, this is definitely a big step because if you have someone like him, someone they talk about might be a future prime minister, Mr. Koizumi, um, you know, doing it, then maybe it's starting to be cool taking even a standard amount of. So, leave. so what? He's a bit of a rock star minister who's trying to blaze the way for other fa fathers. Well, this seems to me like a politician who is doing a bit of virtue signalling and effectively saying that his domestic arrangements are as important as his work. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I mean, in the end, this is a, an environment minister we're talking about, and I'm pretty sure that his constituents would think that climate change issues, for example, are far more important than that you know, the time he will be spending with his baby. And I'm afraid it's a fact of but life. But is he going to be using green diapers on his, <laughs> on his child? Apparently, Japan has generous leave allowances, as you were saying, but um, people feel guilty about taking time off. And some have been harassed by their employers for daring to take oh, paternity leave. Yes. They call it patahara, paternity leave. You've got the whole thing about like, overworking, working yourself to death, in a sense, from the exhaustion, the long hours. So this really is, you know, may seem like small fry for us, but it, it's generally big in this sense for Japan. Great. OK, and uh, finally, this is a, 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 a weird little story um, brought to our attention by the, uh, our editor, who was very excited to find out that it is National Pothole Day. Mm. Um, this is a major complaint in, in several villages, including my own, the number of potholes in roads which just aren't getting, uh, getting fixed. Well, I mean, in Britain, we moan a lot about we do, potholes. Yeah. And, you know, it's... It's a, it's a national discussion as the weather. Mm. But uh, in India, it certainly is right. a matter of life and death. And uh, I have to say, I've seen a video of a, a terrifying incident, one of the most shocking incidents I've seen, actually, people standing at the bus stop and uh, literally the ground opening up, maybe, you know, a larger pothole, you know, which, was, which swallowed a vast amount of people. And six people have died, a lot have disappeared which indicates that, you know... They, I mean, they... I am absolutely astounded by the figures. Mm -hmm. Over 2,000 lives lost in pothole-related accidents in the last three years. Uh, that, that seems incredible to me. Why is it so hard to fix a road? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, when you look at the UK, that's what so Boris Johnson and his government have pledged to try and tackle. It's a potholes fund. And certain pundits and commentators all laughed at him, thought, how piffling is this? Just the things that councillors all point out in the local newspapers. But, you know, look at the majority he won. Partly, you may say, to do a Brexit. It may be to do potholes. Get the potholes done. Well, I mean, clearly, our problem isn't as bad as India's problem. Quite. And one hopes that it will never get as bad. But... In the UK, can, campaigners have declared potholes a national crisis, and they're saying that local authorities need nearly 10 billion quid to bring them up to scratch. Can that be right? Well, exactly. I mean, more money can go down the hole, as it were. You, know, you have to try and <laughs> fix them at the end of the day. Not so much a pothole <laughs> as a black hole. <laughs> Guys, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, great to have you in the studio, Nabila Ramdani and Asa Bennett there. And that's it from us on this news hour. As ever, we're going to leave you with some of the most striking images from news stories from around the world. I'll be back right after this. Stay with us.